tonight at 10, a damning report into a private hospital where three people with learning difficulties died. Corston Park Hospital in Norfolk is now closed, but the report says other similar facilities should no longer receive public money. 36-year-old Joanna Bailey had learning difficulties. She should have been checked on every 30 minutes. On the night she died, she'd been left alone for two hours. It makes me feel <coughs> very angry because I think that if they'd have done what they should have done, if they'd have cared for Joanna as they should have done, she might have been alive today. The report highlighted an excessive use of restraint and over-medication also tonight. A new record for the number of people in England waiting for hospital treatment, more than 5.6 million amid warnings it will go even higher. From next month, anyone in Scotland wanting to go to nightclubs, festivals, major sporting events will need a vaccine passport to prove they've been double jabbed. France criticises UK plans to turn back some boats carrying migrants across the Channel to England. More than 1,500 have arrived this week alone. And the extraordinary British teenager, Emma Raducanu, just hours away from the semi-final at the US Open. And coming up in the sport on the BBC News Channel, tomorrow's final test between England and India will go ahead. That's despite another COVID scare. Good evening. An investigation into the deaths of three adults with learning disabilities and autism at Corston Park Hospital in Norfolk has called for a review of similar private institutions around the country to prevent what it calls lethal outcomes. Joanna Bailey, Nicholas Bryant and Ben King died between April 2018 and July last year. The report found significant failings, including the excessive use of restraint and seclusion by unqualified staff the over-medication of patients and high levels of inactivity and days of abject boredom. Corston Park has now closed. Its owners say they're deeply sorry. Norfolk Police have now named a man wanted in connection with the continuing investigations. This report from our social affairs correspondent Alison Holt contains some distressing details. Set in large grounds in the Norfolk countryside, Corston Park was meant to be offering short-stay assessment and treatment to its patients. But today's report found failings at every level at this private hospital. Ben, who had learning disabilities, spent 17 months here. Inactivity meant his weight ballooned, and in July last year he died after a breathing disorder connected to obesity was incorrectly diagnosed. Shortly before his death, in the top corner of these CCTV pictures, a staff member is seen roughly dragging and pushing him. Today, Norfolk Police have said they want to speak to this man as part of an investigation into ill treatment. This is precious family video of Joanna Bailey as a child. She had learning disabilities, autism and later developed epilepsy. In her 30s, she struggled to cope. I'm here a little yeah. memorial for Joanna. Her father says at Corston Park she wasn't helped with the breathing mask she needed when sleeping. She was meant to be checked regularly, but that didn't happen on the night she died of an epileptic fit, and staff didn't attempt to resuscitate her. It makes me feel very angry because I think that if they'd have done what they should have done, if they'd have cared for Joanna as they should have done, she might have been alive today. There was lack of treatment, there was no treatment. They're just put in there, and if you want for a better word, just left to get on with it, just locked up. A third patient, Nicholas, died the day after he asked to be taken to hospital. He was told it wasn't necessary. Ten years ago, the BBC's Panorama programme exposed abuse at another private hospital, Winterbourne View. The woman who wrote the official report into that scandal is behind today's report. The deaths of three young adults are a searing indictment of assessment and treatment services and I think if there is an image that should stay with us, it's that of Ben's mother pleading with a senior clinician at Corston Park Hospital to get an ambulance for her son. That was in the hours before he died. That, that was not addressed. Families want people with learning disabilities and autism to be supported in the community. Theatre classes are just one part of 22-year-old Adam's busy life. But in 2019, he spent six weeks in Corston Park. 
hear that kind of lights He up. communicates okay. with sign language. Like His one. mother found him being pinned down by staff. He looked up at me. <laughs> he looked up at me and signed, Mummy Hope. I said, OK, Mummy, I'm going to go home. I'm taking you home. So I'm taking you home. And they kept saying, you can't take him home. And I just said, watch me. And none of these places should be open, none of them at all. They should all be shut down. The hospital has closed and its owners have apologised to the families. But today's report also questions the profit motive behind such places and asks why are they still operating. Well, Alison joins me now and terrible what happened to those patients. Given what happened at Winterbourne View and the promises that were made after, it is shocking too that the hospital was still open. Indeed. The promise, Sophie, was that all such places would close by 2014. That was the first of um, many missed deadlines. And the Department of Health and Social Care and the NHS have tried to move more people out into the community. There tends to be a lack of services there for people to move into. And the latest official statistics show that there are still more than 2,000 um, people in long-stay hospitals. Most have been there for more than two years. Now, this is expensive care. Ben's care was costing the, the NHS £26,000 a month. And one of the arguments is that can be much better used in the community, providing services that work for people with learning disabilities and autism. The report itself says that companies need to be held to account for the care they're providing. They question why the NHS and local authorities are still buying such services and they call and it calls for tougher regulation. Alison Holt, thank you. The number of people waiting for routine operations in England has hit another record high. At the end of July, 5.6 million people were waiting to start treatment. The latest figures also show the number of patients waiting more than a year has fallen slightly to under 300,000, but it remains far higher than pre-pandemic levels. There were also issues with the waiting times for ambulances in the most urgent cases, as our health correspondent Anna Collinson reports. Treating more than half a million COVID patients in the UK has come at a cost. In England alone, those waiting for hospital treatments like hip and knee operations has reached a new record high. That's 5.6 million people living with prolonged pain. This afternoon, the health secretary was at Moorfields Eye Hospital. The biggest challenge right now is the waiting list. Where he was shown new technology which could help reduce waiting times. There's some 7 million people who uh, haven't come forward in the normal way because of the pandemic now. Waiting lists will go up before they start coming back down again and that's because I want those people that stayed away to come forward and not to feel that they can't. The NHS is there uh, for them. One symptom of the pandemic pressures is ambulance response times. The target for most serious calls is seven minutes, but latest figures from NHS England showed they averaged at around eight and a half minutes in August. Category 2 calls, which include strokes and heart attacks, averaged around 39 minutes. The aim is 18. Long waiting times are being seen across the UK, but are measured differently, so can't be compared. An ambulance service says it's investigating why this crew took over half an hour to respond to a Category 1 call, where a man suffered a cardiac arrest. Professor Kalish Chand passed away, and his son, a doctor, believes the delay caused his death. Every minute of delay counts in this situation when you have a cardiac arrest because CPR is very important, but it will not in itself save the patient. It gives you a bit of time until someone gets a defibrillator. By the time the ambulance crew came, there was nothing to shock. It was a flat line. He was gone. You're doing really well. We're making good progress. Services like this cancer hub at Mile End Hospital in London have been set up to alleviate demand elsewhere. Thousands of procedures like colonoscopies have taken place since its launch in March. So no polyps, no cancer. During the pandemic, many patients failed to come to hospital because they were worried about coming into contact with the coronavirus. One of the benefits of this early diagnosis centre is that it's set away from emergency care. It means if you go straight through those doors, you go into a safe COVID-free zone.
The NHS in England is set to receive an extra £5 billion over the coming months to respond to COVID pressures. But health officials fear there will be further challenges as we head into the difficult winter months. Anna Collinson, BBC News. From the start of next month, people in Scotland who want to go to nightclubs, large concerts, festivals and major sporting events will have to prove that they have been double vaccinated against COVID. The Scottish Parliament has today approved plans to introduce a domestic vaccine passport scheme. Our Scotland correspondent Lorna Gordon has more. Her report does contain flashing images. It's packed and they're having a party. In three weeks' time, these clubbers will have to prove they've been double vaccinated to get in. Um, I think it's good to show that you've had the vaccine um, and it's good to encourage people to get the vaccine as well. People our age are the ones going out and like not all of us have actually had the chance to be fully vaccinated yet, so that's not very fair. Masks are not required here while drinking or dancing but are needed elsewhere. Nightclubs are one of the last sectors to reopen. And some owners believe with these measures, they're again being singled out. I think it's going to be cause problems at the door, cause problems with the security. But most importantly, I'm against them being brought in discriminatorily. Why not bring them in if they're going to bring them in at all for all of hospitality? It isn't right that if there's three, four hundred people in a club and the pub next door's got a thousand and they don't need them. Cabinet Secretary. But the Scottish Government warns larger events pose risks and believe vaccine passports will directly reduce the transmission in these settings. It is a proportionate response to a world in which there is the continued risk of serious harm from COVID if the choice is between sectors and settings being closed the government believes it is right to make a choice in favour of a limited certification scheme. The opposition believe there are unanswered questions. Can he tell Parliament and people watching what his definition in this context of a nightclub is? The vaccine certification could give people a false sense of security. But you can still be carrying COVID and you will be allowed into the nightclub to infect everyone else. But this is a medical ID in all but name. Let me be clear, vaccines are without question our best route out of the pandemic, but vaccine passports are not. Certification has, by the government's own admission, provoked controversy and there was a small protest outside Parliament against it. But from October the 1st, vaccine passports will be needed to enter nightclubs and other large events here. There's still questions over where it'll apply, the logistics, how the vaccine status app will work. But the Scottish Government hopes certification will push more eligible people to get vaccinated and help avoid further lockdowns. Norma Gordon, BBC News. Well, let's take a look now at the latest coronavirus figures. Just over 38,000 new infections were recorded in the latest 24-hour period. So, on average, there were 38,905 cases per day in the last week. More than 8,000 people are in hospital being treated for COVID. 167 deaths were reported in the past 24 hours. That's people who died within 28 days of a positive COVID-19 test. The average number of deaths per day over the past week is 132. Just under 89% of people over the age of 16 have had their first COVID vaccine and a little over 80% have now had both doses. Well, our health editor, Hugh Pym, is with me now. So more than 8,000 people in hospital this week for the first time since the middle of March. Cases are remaining stubbornly high. Uh, are any warning lights flashing now? Well, Sophie, yes, cases daily reported are up just over 15% week on week. Hospital admissions are also up week on week, though nowhere near the peak back in January. Now, these don't yet fully reflect the return of schools in England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We'll have to wait a little longer for the data on that. And of course, in Scotland, when schools returned in August, that was seen as a factor as communities opened up, a factor in a sharp rise in cases there. Boris Johnson told the BBC in an interview yesterday he was concerned about the situation. And experts are really not quite clear where things go from here as winter approaches, though clearly the success of the vaccination programme has given a lot more protection against serious illness. That being said, the government's announced in England uh, today a consultation on making vaccinations mandatory for NHS frontline staff, along with compulsory flu jabs 
as well. Now that's already been announced for care home staff in England. There'll be a consultation now for the NHS. It's a very sensitive issue. Some will argue it's bad for morale and if there's this sort of measure people will leave NHS jobs. Ministers though are said to be undecided at this stage. Hugh, thank you. More than 12,500 migrants have crossed the channel to the UK this year, with more than 1,500 arriving this week alone. Now the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, has authorised the border force to push back boats into French water, but only in limited circumstances. It has prompted a war of words between Britain and France over who has ultimate responsibility for the growing numbers making the dangerous journey. Our Home Affairs correspondent, Daniel Sanford, is in Dover for us now. Daniel. Yes, Sophie, the number of migrants uh, crossing the channel in small boats this week has been extraordinarily high. Just this afternoon, we saw another 50 arriving on a border, fo border force vessel and being unloaded, having been picked up uh, in the channel. And the Home Secretary, Priti Patel, is under great pressure from within her own party. And overnight, it emerged that she has now authorised this controversial new tactic under which border force vessels will push back some migrant vote boats towards France. She's been in talks with the acting attorney general and with other lawyers about trying to identify the limited circumstances in which that would be legal under maritime and international law. And of course those will be quite limited because of the safety concerns. A very flimsy boat overloaded being pushed by a large vessel clearly isn't going to be something that's viable or safe and it's also going to be difficult without the cooperation of the French and the French made quite clear their view of the whole idea today when the French Foreign Minister took to Twitter saying France will not accept any practices that are contrary to maritime law nor any financial blackmail and that's a reference to the fact that the Home Secretary threatened to withdraw some of the funding towards the French policing of their coastline and it didn't end there the war of words because later a ministry, Minister of Interior official said in a briefing that they hoped that the UK side would come to their senses. It's getting very messy, Sophie. Daniel Sanford in Dover, thank you. 20 years after the 9-11 terror attacks on America which killed nearly 3,000 people, the man who's thought to have masterminded them, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, and his four key associates are in court for pre-trial hearings. It's their 42nd appearance, and the judge is the eighth to have presided over the case which has been bogged down for years. The proceedings are taking place in Guantan Guantanamo Bay in Cuba, from where our North America correspondent Alim Mabou sent this report. A demand for justice following that horrific day 20 years ago led to a wide-reaching response, but one that since led to accusations the US perpetrated injustice. In a tiny corner of Cuba, one notorious byproduct of the 9-11 attacks still remains. Prisoners are still being held in limbo in Guantanamo Bay. Well, of course, the US authorities have allowed us to be here, but they are extremely restrictive in controlling what we can show in terms of people and structures. They certainly haven't allowed us anywhere near the detention facilities where the remaining prisoners are being held. When I was last here, things were very different. We saw some detainees mingle and eat together and interact with the guards, though we knew of other camps where prisoners didn't have such privileges. We were even able to wander through the long-abandoned Camp X-Ray, where in the months after the 9-11 attacks, men and boys were first transferred, interrogated, and in many cases, tortured. Of nearly 800 men and boys who've been detained at Guantanamo Bay, 39 remain. About a quarter were cleared for release as far back as 2010, but are still waiting to leave. Two have been charged and convicted in what are called military commissions. Seventeen have never been charged, but will remain in prison for life because they're deemed a security threat. The other ten are still awaiting trial. They include five men accused of involvement in the 9-11 attacks. Well, for the first time in more than 18 months, those five men were inside a courtroom. We couldn't film it, but we were in the gallery just through the glass, just feet away from those defendants, including at the very front there with the ginger beard, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the man who it's believed conceived of the idea of 9-11 and took that idea.
to Osama bin Laden. But the proceedings themselves were extremely slow. People often ask, is there an end in sight? And for a long, long time, there was not even a middle in sight. But now, we are in the middle of the case because the wrestling with the question of what effect torture has on the admissibility of statements is really the heart of the case. Detail. Hope. But that's where things are stuck. All the while, the family members of those killed in 9-11 wait for resolution, and the detention center here looks no closer to shutting down. And every time there are these pre-trial hearings involving the 9-11 suspects, family members of victims of the attacks are invited to come and observe proceedings, and indeed some have been here this week. They've often talked about how difficult it is to sit so close to men accused of involvement in killing their loved ones. They've talked about their frustration about how, to, how after all this time they still don't even have a trial date for those men. And of course it's all the more difficult this visit because they'll be commemorating the 20th anniversary of the tragedy in just a couple of days' time, a long way from home and in a place with such a dark and uncomfortable history. Ali McGoo, thank you. The Democratic Unionist Party leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, has suggested his party could leave the power-sharing devolved government in Northern Ireland unless its concerns about post-Brexit trading arrangements known as the Northern Ireland Protocol are dealt with. Sinn Féin has called the comments reckless. The United States Department of Justice has filed a lawsuit against the state of Texas over its new abortion law, which outlaws terminations after six weeks of pregnancy. Doctors and women's rights groups have strongly condemned the law, which took effect last week after the Supreme Court's decision not to block it. Thirteen British nationals have managed to leave Kabul on the first international commercial flight from Afghanistan's capital since the military evacuation ended 12 days ago. They were part of a group of more than 100 foreign nationals who arrived in Doha aboard a Qatar Airways flight that was allowed to take off by the Taliban. Now, in the last few minutes, the winner of this year's Mercury Prize has been announced. It's the singer-songwriter Arlo Parks, and she's just 20 years old. This is the track Eugene from her debut album Collapsed in Sunbeams. Arlo Parks got her first break in the music business after sending a demo to the BBC. Well, our entertainment correspondent Colin Patterson is at the Hammersmith Apollo in London where the awards are taking place. Colin. And I'm here with the winner, Arlo Parks. The judges described you for having a singular voice. They said that was one of the factors. And the themes of this album, Collapse and Sunbeams, they've dealt with anxiety, it's dealt with loneliness, mental health, many of the issues people went through during lockdown. In what mm. way do you think that actually helped this album connect with people? I guess it's the honesty at the core of it. It's the fact that I'm kind of trying to talk about real experiences and what it's like to be a human being. And that's a bittersweet thing. So I'm just glad people have enjoyed it. We're outside the Hammersmith Apollo. You used to cycle by here every day on the way to school. How special is this place to you? I mean, incredibly special. I grew up really close to here, and like I used to have my school Christmas carol services in the church, literally right opposite. So very much feels like a kind of homecoming in some way. Your parents still live 10 minutes up the road in exactly. that house. <laughs> you still have your childhood bedroom, and a couple of the songs on the album were actually written in that room. What's it like? I mean, again, I. It feels, it feels really fulfilling. It feels like I'm doing something purposeful and I'm glad that I've just been kind of welcomed with open arms by being myself and making music I love. Mm. What do you want to do next then? What can this album open up doors towards? I guess just continuing making more music, more collaborations, just being able to finally tour and travel the world and meet different people and just keep making music I'm proud of. And back to your parents for a cup of tea right now? Probably, yeah. Give us a look at the trophy. Congratulations, Colin. Thank you, and congratulations to Arlo Parks. Now, in just over three hours' time, the British teenage tennis sensation Emma Raducanu will step on court in New York for the semi-finals of the US Open. She's the first British woman to get that far in the US Open in nearly 40 years. The 18-year-old said she had been so sure she'd be knocked out of the tournament that she had booked her flight back to the UK a fortnight ago. Here's Laura Scott. 
It's been a surreal, sensational summer for Emma Raducanu, and the teenager's fairy tale of New York continues. Her route to the semi-final has been majestic. In what was her toughest assignment yet, she beat Belinda Bencic. Fresh from doing her A-levels, the British underdog had all the answers for the Olympic champion dressed in gold, sealing a spot in the semis in straight sets and a new status as the British number one. Having started here in qualifying, even for one so ambitious, this has been extraordinary. I didn't expect to be here at all. I mean, I think my flights were booked at the end of qualifying, so um, <laughs> it, it's a nice problem to have. But uh, yeah, I'm just really enjoying the experience. Raju Kanu has come from relative obscurity, but there were signs of what was to come last year when she beat Andy Murray in a doubles match. Touch come through. She was ranked outside the world's top 300 when she arrived at Wimbledon for her maiden Grand Slam. In reaching the fourth round as a wild card, Radu Kanu established herself as the new star of British tennis, surprising even those who've been impressed by her from a young age. We knew she was good, but we just didn't expect her to rise, what, rise up the rankings and win all these matches the way she has done. She really has embraced the situation and she has literally run with it. In her box, a new coach, who's not that new at all. She's reunited with Andrew Richardson from Bromley Tennis Centre, where today youngsters told us they've been motivated by her success. So it shows that it doesn't really matter quite how old you are, quite how much experience you have, it's just like how well you can perform. It's amazing to think that she went to my school, I saw her in the corridors and now I'm watching her on TV. From the pages of Vogue to her social media pages, Radu Kanu's already transcending tennis. In the early hours of tomorrow, she faces the big-hitting Greek Maria Sakari for a spot in the final. She says she won't change anything for the biggest match of her life. Why change a winning formula? Laura Scott, BBC News. And that's it from us now on BBC One. It's time for the news where you are. Good night.